Pakistan has been the cradle of Buddhist art and culture and the second holy land of Buddhism for well over a thousand years. The religious faith has marked the most significant epoch in the history of cultural and social evolution in the subcontinent. Indeed, it has been one of the greatest spiritual experiences the world has ever seen and which has left behind one of the finest manifestation in the domain of art and culture. Gandhara, literally meaning the land of fragrance, was the ancient name of the tract of country situated on the west bank of Indus River, which comprises the Peshawar Valley and the modern Sawat, Buner and Bajor. However, in broader context, Texla on the eastern side of River Indus and Bamiyan in the eastern Afghanistan are also included in the Gandhara region. It was a country with rich, well-watered valleys, clay-cut hills and pleasant climate. Situated on the borderland between subcontinent and western Asia, Gandhara belonged as much and as little to the one as to the other. The advent and development of Buddhism owes a great deal to the ancient land of Pakistan. The religious activities reached its climax here through well-organized missionaries and ultimately made it a world religion. This region became one of the most important holy lands of Buddhism and a great number of Chinese pilgrims felt a religious obligation to visit the centers of piety here. Gwatma Buddha was the son of Sadodna, a ruler of Magadha in southern Bihar, was born in 623 BC. Queen Mahamaya, wife of the king, once dreamt that the Bodhisattva, having assumed the form of a noble wild elephant, descended from the Tushita heaven, approached her from the north side, took a white lotus in his silver-colored trunk, and having moved thrice around her couch, entered her womb. Next day, she related the strange dream to her royal husband, who called the sage Asita to explain the meaning of the dream. He told to the royal couple that the queen had conceived a son who will become either a universal monarch or a Buddha. The Mahamaya, having carried the Bodhisattva for 10 months in a womb, wished to visit her parents' home. While on way to her destination, she desired to take rest in a player park of sal trees called the Lumbini Groove having reached the foot of a noble sal tree. She took hold of one of its branches and was delivered of her child while standing Indra and Brahma appeared in the scene to receive the Bodhisattva. When he grew into a young man, he was married to a beautiful girl named Yasudra. However, he preferred solitude and thoughtfulness and paid little attention towards the luxury and entertainments of the palace. At the age of 29, he decided to leave home in quest of truth. He awoke the groom and the swift-footed Chantaka and said, Bring quickly the horse Kantaka. I desire to depart, hence today to reach deathlessness. In the darkness of night, he rode away towards the forest, where he discarded his royal rubies and ornaments, cut his long hair and became an ascetic. Prince Siddhartha, during his early wanderings, practiced rigid austerities and resorted to various kinds of self-tortures of or six years, and was reduced to a skeleton. Yet real knowledge he was seeking eluded him. Ultimately, he realized that physical torture was not the way to achieve the enlightenment. He then decided to partake food grains and drank a bowl of milk. Then at Putkya, under a pipal tree, he took up the supreme, immovable cross-legged posture with his limbs massed together, like the coils of a sleeping serpent, saying, I will not rise from this position on the ground till I achieve the completion of my task. At the moment of the fourth watch, when the dawn came up and all that moves or moves not was stilled, the great seer reached the state which is known of alteration, the state of omniscience, 
when he knew this truth the earth swayed like a woman drunken with wine the quarters shone bright with crowds and mighty drums resounded in the sky then for 7 days free from discomfort of body he sat looking into his own mind his eyes never winking he had thus discovered enlightenment raising him from the status of bodhisattva to that of a buddha seeing that the world was lost in false views and vain efforts and that its passions were gross seeing too that the law of salvation was exceedingly subtle he set his mind on remaining immobile then the two chiefs of the heavenly dwellings learning that the buddha's mind had taken the decision to preach tranquility they approached him o sage having yourself crossed beyond the ocean of existence rescue the world which is drowning in suffering bestow your excellence on others also the sage pondered on that speech the decision grew strong in him for the liberation of the world he then set out to preach the doctrines of his philosophy and in the deer park of sarnath delivered his first sermon which was termed in buddhist terminology the setting in motion the wheel of the dharma when the buddha attained the age of 80 years he felt that his end was at hand he proceeded to kusinagara and asked his disciple anada to spread a cloth on the ground between two sal trees he was born between two sal trees in the lumbini gardens and was to die in a similar state he laid down and gave his last admonition to thousands of monks who had assembled there to have a last glimpse of their master he uttered his last words now monks i have nothing more to tell you but that all that is compassed is liable to decay strive after salvation energetically originally stupa used to be a simple tupulus or burial mound used to enshrine the ashes of the dead bodies the earliest mound forms that can properly be termed stupas those at sanchi barhad and dharmarajika are hemispherical masses of earth raised on a base and faced with brick or stone the structure is surrounded by a processional path the whole being enclosed by a stone railing and topped by a hermika though in its development the stupa often became elaborate and complex in its purest form the plan consisted of a circle within a square the stupa became an object of veneration since the time of ashoka who encouraged the building of stupas in order to promote buddhism ashoka decided to erect a large number of monuments commemorating the glory of the buddha According to the traditions he erected 84000 stupas in all major cities and places of pilgrimage of his empire and enshrined relics of the Buddha in those stupas The motive of Alexander's invasion of Asia was to take avenge the Achaemenians of Persia who invaded Macedonia and rest of Greece during the times of Alexander's father Philip Alexander invaded Persia and defeated the Achaemenian king Darius at the battle of Gogamela in 331 BC. After conquering Persia, Alexander marched through the area comprising present-day Pakistan. At that time, it was part of the Persian Empire. When Alexander crossed River Indus at Hand, the king of Texela was present there to welcome him. Alexander stayed at Texela to prepare for final battle with King Porus of Sialkot. In a decisive combat at the bank of River Jhelum, King Porus was defeated. However, the Greek occupation lasted only for about 20 years when sometimes in 312 BC, the Mauryan king Chandragupta took over its possession from the weakling Greek satraps. through the social cultural pattern of the greeks penetrated in the local society to a great extent however it was during the long reign of the grandson of chandragupta the celebrated ashoka 272 to 237 bc that gandhara became the veritable center of buddhism when the king was converted to the faith and became its ardent and enthusiastic patron During his long reign he built numerous stupas and monasteries throughout Gandhara in Shahbaz Ghari Mansera and Texela 
while at Shahbaz Ghari in Mansur are located his famous rock edicts. After the death of Ashoka in 237 BC, the West again gradually asserted itself, and in the second century BC, Greek dynasties took the place of Indian. Then came early in the first century BC the victorious Sakas or Scythians to be followed after yet another century by the Perthians and Kushans. And even then, the tale of foreign conquest was not ended. For in the third century AD, Gandhara again reverted to Persia. Now under Sassanid sovereigns, and was again reconquered by the Kidara Kushans in the fourth. Finally, the death blow to its prosperity was given by the Ephelites of White Huns, who swept over the country about AD 465, carrying fire and sword wherever they went, and destroying the Buddhist monasteries. Throughout this long period of foreign domination, which lasted for well over a thousand years. Buddhism prospered in Gandhara as a dominant religion. A large number of Buddhist sanctuaries were founded under royal patronage. The first city of Texala, called the Bir Mound, stands on a small plateau near the western end of the valley. It was this city which Ashoka ruled as a viceroy, and later on as Mauryan emperor, organizing from here what is now regarded as the greatest missionary work. Ever recorded in world history. It was also this city that saw Alexander's visitation in 326 BC. Archaeological excavations could uncover only part of a city, revealing that it was of an irregular shape, measuring about 600 meters from east to west, and one kilometer from north to south. The excavations have also revealed that the city was destroyed and rebuilt thrice. The first city witnessed the Achaemenian occupation, while in the fourth century it was remodeled under Ambi Omphis, king of Texala, on the occasion of visitation of Alexander the Great. About two kilometers east of Bir Mound is situated the majestic Dharmarajika Stupa and Monastery. Originally erected by the Emperor Ashoka, there were more than a dozen such great establishments, which represented some of the best specimens of Gandharan art and architecture. The Dharmarajika Stupa, the earliest and the biggest erection of its kind on the soil of Pakistan. Traditionally, it contained the celebrated relics of the Buddha. On plan, it is circular with its drum, resting on a raised terrace. Approached by four flights of steps, provided at each cardinal point, the raised terrace and the open passage around the main body of the stupa served as the procession path for circumambulation. The excavations at the Dhammarajika stupa yielded a number of interesting as well as important objects. Among these, the most remarkable was a reliquary discovered from the side rooms, which contained a silver scroll. With the Harushti inscription, recording that the associated relics were those of the Buddha himself. Sirkap, the second city of Texala, was founded by the Bactrian Greeks on the usual rectangular grid pattern in the second century BC. It was fortified by a massive 21 feet wide perimeter wall of stone with bastions at regular intervals, and an acropolis on a flat-topped hill. The plan of the city evidently shows the services of some Hellenistic town planner were requisitioned for the layout of the city. Excavations have revealed the remains of some of the most spectacular buildings, both religious as well as secular, including the marketplace, houses of the commoners, the royal palace, the shrine of the double-headed eagles. Absidal Temple is sector. All along the main street, a regular row of shops run on its either side, while at its back were arranged blocks of residential houses. On the western side, overlooking the main street, was the spacious royal palace, having private hall of audience, court of guards, the hall of public audience, the residential quarters, etc. In the women's quarters was a small court having a small stupa, evidently a private chapel. The great absidal temple, located on the east of the main street, stands in a spacious courtyard with two raised platforms. 
The rich and resourceful residents of this well-planned city led a life of opulence and luxury. This is evident from the wealth of material, including the gold jewelry and silver, were uncovered during the excavations. The city remained in occupation for 300 years during the successive rule of Greeks, Scythians, Parthians, and Kushans, down to the time of Virna Karpises, when it again shifted to the side of Sirsuk. One of the best known and well preserved Buddhist monuments in Gandhara is the stupa and monastery of Takhtbai. Located on a rocky ridge about 10 miles northeast of Mardan, it stands 500 feet above the plain and is approached by a steep and winding path. The features which distinguish it from other Buddhist establishments are its architectural diversity and its romantic and extraordinary setting in the high mountains. The exposed buildings here include the main stupa and two courtyards created on different terraces augmented with votive stupa and shrines and the monastic quadrangle surrounded by the cells for monks and a large square hall of assembly. In one of the stupa courtyards is a line of colossal Buddhas which were originally 16 to 20 feet high. The history of the Buddhist establishments at Takhtbai shrouded in mystery. The name has been interpreted to have been adopted from a reservoir as they are located too big and a deep artificial water tanks. Nor do we find its mention in the accounts left by the Chinese pilgrims who visited the areas during the later periods. It has been estimated that the site was selected for building these Buddhist establishments sometimes in the 1st century BC and the building activities continued until the time it was destroyed by the White Huns under Mehergula. The most important buildings so erected here included the monastic complex located on the northern ridge, access to which was provided through majestic gates on the north and south. The neighboring city of Sehri Behlol provided food, drinks and other necessities of life to the monks living here. The monastery is located on a higher level approached by a flight of steps while the main stupa is accessible through a bigger flight of 19 steps. There are 35 votive stupas embellished with figures in stucco and stone. The monastery is square on plan, 62 feet sides with cells arranged on three sides, each cell having ventilation and a niche. The monastery was evidently two-storied building. Outside the monastery on the west, there is a long narrow passage, 50 feet long and 5 feet broad. It was used as an assembly hall, while on its south are low-level chambers having cobbled roof. A large number of antiquities, including reliefs, panels and statues, representing the specimens of Gandhara art, were found from the ruins of these structures. The ruins remained buried and unnoticed for a very long time until the early decades of the last century, when the French and the British enthusiasts started digging the various parts of the site in search of sculptures. Systematic archaeological excavations at the site were started by Dr. D.B. Spooner of the Archaeological Survey in early 20th century. 